do have a, a great group of actors and the writer-director of the film here tonight, um, who I would like to welcome at this time. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to introduce an actor you might remember from such shows as Entourage and The Sopranos. He's so wonderfully obnoxious in this film as Randy. Um, please welcome Polly Herman. There he is. And he knows how to make an entrance. Um, also, please welcome a two-time SAG Award winner for his role in the Boardwalk Empire Ensemble, Shea Wiggum. Uh, Chris Tucker will be joining us. It's a sh He's here! Oh my gosh! Okay, because I wrote a really cool introduction for him. Uh, no, I just want to say this is an actor who I've missed so much from the big screen. He's always fantastic in everything, from films like Friday to The Fifth Element to, of course, the Rush Hour films. So happy to see him back on screens as Danny. Please welcome Chris Tucker. There he is. <laughs> Finally, the writer-director of the film. This is an auteur known for getting great performances out of actors with completely original material, from Flirting with Disaster to Three Kings to The Fighter, for which he received his first, note I say first, Academy Award nomination for Best Director. Um, just today, his screenplay to this film was named Best Adapted Screenplay by the National Board of Review. <laughs> It was also named for Best Actor, Bradley Cooper, so that's... It's probably out celebrating, that's why I can't be here. Um, and at last, one of the ten best films of the year, please welcome David O. Russell. Oh. Okay, since David is an actor, he doesn't know we can't have labels oh. on camera. Okay. So we'll just hide that for now. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. Congratulations on a beautiful movie. Um, congratulations on today's awards. This is a huge deal. How did you find out about the win? Uh, um, I was working on, uh, on um, the next movie, and uh, my publicist ca uh, called me. And that was, a, that was always a nice surprise. It was, it was, it was, um, it, was, it was lovely, yeah. And, and what did you say? I, I just, you know, you know, you're kind of speechless. You know, you feel really good when that happens, you know, because you can't think about it too much. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You just can't really focus on it. You just have to be, do the work and be grateful you do the work. So I was really surprised. I mean, I think it's so nice, you know, because it's such a game changer for Bradley Cooper. And it's so, it's so uh, you know, that's how I felt when Amy Adams got recognized in The Fighter for doing such a different role for her. And so I feel he's done such a different role. So I was, I was mostly very happy for him, you know. Um, and there's so many good pictures this year. I just am happy to represent our picture. Have you talked to Bradley? What did he say? Um, he's on the set of The Hangover 3. And um, that's where he is tonight <laughs> in Calabasas shooting. Um, uh, but I think that... Uh, as grateful as he is for that franchise, I think that's going to be—he's going to have some new horizons ahead of him. And I think it's, you know, he, uh, Bradley, uh, was just sort of speechless as well. You know, he's just—he doesn't like to think about it either, um, um, especially because I think uh, he's not used to uh, this arena. So I think he, as a new, as a newcomer, he wants to be respectful about it and just and just grateful about it. Have you explained to him he better get used to it? <laughs> no, that would be um, that would be like. Um, LeBron James talk. I can't think you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we do, this is a SAG audience here, I want to ask the actors, um, do you remember how you got your SAG card? Do I? Yeah. A long time ago. <laughs> well, how did you get I, it, Paul? I'm trying to think what, it might have been Once Upon a Time. Into the mic. Into the mic. Into the once mic. Upon a Time in America, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, wow. Yeah. It really was a long time ago. I think it was like 1978 or 80, 79. And uh, one of the first films I remember doing, the uh, first film I ever did was a, uh, an NYU student film. Just, you know, you, that's the only way you could get film on yourself. 
years ago because there was no uh, DVDs, you know, there were no digital cameras, uh, there were no iPhones, there was no way. Right now you can make your own movie on an iPhone. We had to do student films, NYU student people, you know, would all collaborate and they would make a film and they needed actors. So if you hadn't, didn't have any film on yourself, you did an NYU student film and then at least you got film on yourself. So other than that, I think the next one was Once Upon a Time in America, which I did a small part for Sergio Leone. Is that where you first met Robert De Niro? Uh, no, actually I knew him before. Oh. We both studied many years ago at Stellar Atlas and uh, we sort of passed each other. I, I studied at night, he studied in the daytime. And obviously he learned a little more than I did. <laughs> <laughs> so we did know each other. He, as a matter of fact, recommended me to, you know, to the casting person. And then I went in and met Sergio Leone and so forth. And I you know, wow. got a, sort of a small part, but it was great. It was my person. It's a great person to have in your corner. Shay, what about you? Uh, I got mine on the uh, uh, Toshiba commercial where I was an extra. You know, you fight really hard for that SAG. I mean, it, it means a lot. It meant a lot. It still means, what I was just saying, as much. Uh, uh, I'm a big union guy, and I, um, I'm very proud to be in SAG. It was a Toshiba commercial. You were an extra? Did they bump you up and give you a line? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they what are they, Taft Hartley? You got Taft Hartley? Yeah, yeah. You're so. like an urban legend. I've heard about you people. <laughs> <laughs> I, but it was, I remember it was a, a pretty crowning achievement for me. Yeah. Yeah. Chris? I think I was hanging, hanging with Mr. Cooper on TV. That was my first uh, TV spot. So I did do TV. <laughs> quick, quick shot. Who did you play? I was a DJ on the couch, and I said one thing, and they cut it out. I don't know what it was. I said something. <laughs> I said, that's, that's cool. They said, How did you feel when you learned your line had been cut? Um, I was all right. I was just happy I made it on the thing, so I was, I was okay with it. <laughs> you didn't like no, I was pissed off. I was like, how can they do that? <laughs> they ruined my career. I'm just joking. Um, so I want to start at the beginning with Silver Linings Playbook. Uh, David, this script is based on a book by Matthew Quick. It's your first adapted screenplay. You've always written original screenplays up to this point. Um, what was it about this story and, and the characters of Pat and Tiffany that spoke to you? Um, I'd been looking for a picture that um, dealt with some of the issues that I had dealt with, uh, gone through with my son, my older son, um, and because uh, I thought it'd be wonderful for the for him and for me, for him to feel a part of the world and to feel like he's not so uh, outside the world, my world or the larger world, and um, and that it was perfect. You know, it was really about it was about a more extreme case. The, the, in the book, the person had been. Uh, away for four years, and that was a story I didn't quite know how to tell. But I love the sensibility of the book, the raw emotion of unfiltered characters, um, like my son or my mom or other people I've known who just you know they just they can't they just are very and that has an interesting effect on everybody around them, and it just rips away all the nonsense and makes everybody just be straight up and and emotional about what they're who they are. Um, and, you know, you stand up at dinner and you say, "I'm tired. I want to go home." You know, and they haven't even served the first course yet. <laughs> and so I loved the characters. And um, so I took about, you know, about 20 plus drafts. That's why I was, that's what today meant to me. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, my biggest recognition as a writer, you know, because you, it's, it was five years ago. So it's really been five years of writing. I thought I would make the picture before the fighter. And, uh, you know, you just, things happen in God's time and in, and that, I guess God is the studio. Um, but, or Harvey um, Weinstein. Or, Harvey, but, or both. But, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, things come together when they're meant to, you know. And so we got to keep writing it, and it kept getting better, you know. And I kept making it more particular. And then Robert De Niro came on board, and I wrote for him. And Paulie Herman came on board, and I wrote for him. And Chris Tucker came on board, and I was able to dial it in for him. And Shea Wiggum, and you know, uh, Julia Stiles and John Ortiz. You know, I listened to my actors, my actors, John Ortiz, they all brought so much. You know, they all demand, and you look, you gotta look at the whole movie through every character's point of view, emotionally, uh, and it's a big ensemble to carry. Um, and uh, they all make the world what it is. They all make the world very real and very emotional. Um, and every time he walks on stage and he has to talk about the legal language of people who get plea, plea bargained into a state hospital, and that's all the actual legal language. Um, you know, if uh, if they don't renew the mental hygiene law by by the 
end of your felony sentence, by the maximum length of your felony sentence. That's the law. And he had to learn all, and this guy who- I still don't know the dialogue. I was just gonna say, do you still remember those lines? No. <laughs> we were lucky he remembered it then. But I mean, because it was very hard to say, nobody could remember it. He would say, what is it? And I'd go, I don't know, what is it? We'd have to look at it, because it was very technical language. Um, but it was wonderful for Chris Tucker, who we haven't seen enough of, um, to be, he brought, you know, yeah. You know, it's kind of wonderful because he walks in and it feels like, and, you know, he brings to the movie that he has, feels like he has been away, like Pat has been away. And, and Bradley Cooper feels like someone who, you know, we start on his back, he is reintroducing himself to his community and to us, the audience, you know. Um, and so, you know, and as soon as you get in the house with Paulie and Shay and Bob, De Niro, Robert De Niro, it's very authentic. You know, you just can't, I just want... You know, and John Ortiz and Julia Stiles are the same. Very authentic. And it's just that you can't, it's wonderful. I love listening to him talk even right now, Paulie. Chris, um, I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing it, but we are so happy to have you back. Oh, you. Um, and hopefully you haven't been away the way Danny has been away. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but what, were you looking to return to acting? Were, was this, uh, what was it about this script that you said this is the one? It was different and, 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 David O. Russell, working with David O. o. Russell, you know, um, you know, a great director. You know, that's something that actors look for to work with a good director because it brings stuff out of you. And it was so much fun working with David because sometimes I didn't know my lines, but he knew all the lines. So he would say, he would just say it right there and I would get it and it was, it was perfect. So it was so much fun, it was so much freedom and I was able to bring my own little stuff to it. But working with a great director makes you look good and he made me look good. And what's wonderful is when you have Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper learning to dance and then Chris Tucker steps out there and really knows how to dance. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, that, these are all ideas that happened in the final month of rewriting, you know, you re keep rewriting it all the way up to when you're shooting. Um, and it was originally Sidney Pollack and Anthony Minghella who gave me the book, and I'm so sorry they can't be here to see the picture, um, but, you know, he really understood the heart of it and understood that I knew how it was emotional, sad, intense, raw, but also funny because of all that realness, and that's, you know, I mean, Shay, just when Shay, Shay, how did you, when Shay walks into the movie from the portrait, those portraits yes. are very Philadelphia. You know, when I would go scouting Philadelphia, there were certain things you pick up, language, homemades, the birds, um, you know, crabby snacks, these are all local things. And uh, these portraits, you go in these homes and you see like a whole family in white, turtle, white mock turtlenecks <laughs> with a white background <laughs> on a portrait. And there, or you see like you walk and you see like his, those portraits. And I love that we had, is that your high school portrait? What is that? Yeah, 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 that was my high school. That's your actual <laughs> high school picture? Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't know how they got that. I walked in the first day of filming and it's there. And it was kind of That's freaky. Freaked me out. Yeah. You still don't know how they got it? No, actually, I, I don't know how they got that. How'd I, you get it? I I, I, I'm questioning his answer. <laughs> no, I, I, so, so, sort of like Jackie, Jackie Weaver, who's amazing, the mother, Jackie Weaver from Animal Kingdom. It's so real. Uh, it's an, and she anchors the home. You know, Jackie Weaver had an autobiography that was always in the makeup trailer called Jackie. And it was from Australia. And I would always flip through it. And there was a, a picture of her in a bikini in it from her 20s. You know, she was in Picnic and Hanging Rock. She's an extraordinary uh, actress who does a lot of stage work. And, and uh, it says in the book, in the caption, or she even said, she said, I don't know how that got in there. I don't know how that happened. I go, yeah, how did that happen? How did it end up in your autobiography? <laughs> so I don't know. So how, did, so how did it happen? That you, I don't know how your picture ended up there. But anyway, I love this. It's the first time I've ever shot from um, somebody's high school portrait to them. You know, and it was yeah. such a cool thing because I thought people aren't going to know who this guy is. But if you go... He's coming in halfway through the movie or a third into the movie and you, he's an important figure because it's important to know that he has an older brother that he feels a failure compared to. Mm -hmm. It's a very important color, you know, um, and the, the older brother, that was a wonderful thing that we, we embroidered where he can't, you can't talk about your success, you know, in front of somebody. And that's a very scary thing. I think we've all experienced that from both sides. You know, I've been the one, I've been the unemployed guy trying to be a filmmaker who is at family weddings and stuff and you're like, yeah, I'm, everybody has a car, I don't have a car, everybody, everybody has a house, I don't have a house, you know, I'm like, you're still doing that thing? Yeah, I'm still doing that. <laughs> but what do you do how's for that a living? Going? That how's that going? How's that going? It's going okay. <laughs> David, my mom, would say, tell them the story about when you bartended for Mike Nichols and Jacqueline Onassis. And I would tell all my 
famous bartending stories. Because um, I was a fancy bartender in New York City. But, you know, anyway, so. I'm curious, actually, Che and Polly, how did you guys go about landing your roles? Was it an audition situation? Uh, yeah, what, what, uh, because you brought up before about, you know, my close relationship with Bob over many years in New York. Oh, uh, and <laughs> so everybody always thought every time I got a film, De Niro recommended it. So uh, I had met David years before through Mark Wahlberg, and I had been on the set of The Fighter, and David and I got friendly. I went to see a lot of early screenings of The Fighter, and like one of the 10,000 people I've met in Hollywood, he said, someday, you know, I'd like to work with you, you know, I'd like to put you in a movie. And uh, of the 10,000 people that promised me that, he's the only one that ever called. Oh my God. <laughs> Another urban legend comes true. <laughs> so I was home and I got a call and David was in Philadelphia. And I think they were just ready to start shooting. And he said, I, I want to bring you in for this part in this movie that I'm doing. And I knew that Bob was in it. And I said, oh, did, did Bob recommend it? He said, no, he don't even know. I didn't tell him. Because wow. I'm reading other people. And, uh, but I want you to go to this casting office, but we'll do a Skype session. Uh, and I said, a what? I don't even know. I never knew what a <laughs> Skype session was. Uh, I found out quickly enough, David was in Philadelphia with Bruce Cohen, who was somewhere in the room, one of our producers. And I was on the other end at, uh, in the marina at Mary Bernou's casting, uh, and they didn't even have the sides there, so David was still writing the script, and they were faxing and emailing sides, and he was reading from Philadelphia, and I was reading papers, and they were handing to me, when it was getting all mush -mush mixed up, so we put the papers down, and we just improvised a lot of, after knowing a little about what the scene was, it went on for about an hour and a half, and I walked out of there, and I said, wow. I'll never get that one. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, when you think you did bad, sometimes you did good. When you think you did good, you strike out. Anyway, a couple of days later, he called me and he said, I want you to do the part. And then I said, well, uh, did you tell Bob? And he said, no, you don't know, but I'm having dinner with him tonight, and I'm going to tell him. And that night, they had dinner, and they called me from the restaurant, and uh, Bob congratulated me for getting it. And that's how I got it. That's great. I mean, yeah. He's, uh, Paulie's been quite humble. He's done 13 films with, with De Niro. It's, I mean, I don't... Uh, yeah, but I, we only... But no, I know, but you, you've done... I, we were in 13 <laughs> films together, but we only worked together four times. I mean, we were both in Goodfellas, but we didn't have any scenes together. We were both in Once Upon a Time in America. We didn't have scenes together. There were only three or four films that we had scenes in other than this was the most uh, mm -hmm. silver lining playbook and also the best. But um, for me, I, I, De Niro to me was, is, is a hero. I mean, he's, well, I grew up watching him. To me, it started with Brando and then the, the, the baton was passed to Robert De Niro. So for me, I, I, I had real trouble at the start of this piece with being able to, I didn't even speak to him, I don't think, for about a week and a half. Um, and that's true. I, I just, we just felt each other out. And David, I kept telling David, he said, it, it's okay, it'll be okay. I, I, I don't know what, you know. I, you know, so it was, it, and, it, and then it, it, it grew into this, this organic thing. And uh, it's, he's the most lovely kind. To me, he's the reason that makes him so great. And I'll, I'll get to Paulie too, because the, the great thing is uh, at the end of this, I had him and Paul, De Niro and Paul, telling me stories about Mean Streets. They were telling me stories about Deer Hunter when he almost died, him and Chris Walken, and, 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 and Taxi Driver. I, and I, I told him I used to walk like uh, Travis Bickle for a week back when I was at SUNY Purchase um, because I, I thought it would make me a better actor, being able to walk pigeon-toed like Robert De Niro. You know, so it was, a, it was for me, it was, and, and to hear these guys tell these stories, and David and I talk about it all, that we listen. It, to be a fly on the wall with them is... I mean, it was, uh, in addition to working with a genius like David O. Russell, you know, you, you can't get any better. And how did you get your part? Um, I, I did the same thing. I Skyped for the first, very first time, the only time I've ever Skyped. I go meet, David's going to read on a little computer, and I was like, uh, all right, okay. And I, they gave me the sides, and they got thrown out the window, and David and I, next thing you know, were riffing for about an hour, and we were just playing about... You know, I, I, what do you think? What do you think about Jake? What do you, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I and uh, so then we just played and I, it, it went 
I didn't know how it went actually, yeah. and then uh, so then I and I got it from him. So. Well, you bring the whole character to life where he's telling you about all this stuff that's so great, and the brother's just staring at him, and you think the brother's going to go bipolar, <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah. And Robert De Niro saying, "Just stop, stop saying all the things that are good for you and bad for him." <laughs> yeah, well, again, that was. I mean, he just came up with that on the spot, De Niro. I mean, and and, and David again. It's like I've been on a nice run, a knock wood, with some great living legend directors, but there's no been no no experience like David O. Russell. He's he is he is brilliant. What you see up there is is no easy feat. This is it takes so much specificity to come up with this film. I can't even explain it to you. It looks like it's all going on. Everything's just like ad living, and it is so much specificity that happens on the day, and what in this in this man's mind. And I think they can attest to it also. Because Bob's not here, tell him about when the four of us were the experts. Yeah, well, it was cool. The, 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 I mean, there was so many amazing um, experiences for me. But to see De Niro at his age with his body of work. I didn't know, I was very interested to see how he was going to work. And it, since this is a lot of actors, I usually don't, he doesn't talk about the process. I like that. He never talks about what he does for the underneath. But since you guys are all actors, I, I can tell you that we were, we were preparing, we were going in for the dance scene. We had to stand there for two straight days without a word to watch Bradley and Jennifer dance. And so we had to come running into the, the auditorium. And I remember, uh, I'm, we're getting prepared to come in so we don't do the Hollywood <sighs> breathing like this. So I'm backstage preparing, you know, getting ready in my way. And I see De Niro. There's, there's De Niro. And I look around. Chris is looking. And we're, getting, we're getting prepared. And De Niro's down there doing push-ups, getting into it. <laughs> and and uh, just so he, we'd be breathing. By the time we exploded into the auditorium, and we did that probably six, I don't know, 60 times maybe. And every time we're down, we, hey, Pop, you ready? Yeah, yeah, son. Okay, okay, we'll go watch, yeah, we'll go watch Patty. Okay, yeah, all right, that'd be cool. You think he's going to get a five? I don't know. And bam, we'd go right into the auditorium. And we'd stand there and we'd watch proudly, all of us watch proudly. And, and to see him digging that deeply at, at this stage is, I mean, I, we kind of got emotional sometimes, you know. And we'd go, can you believe this? Look at this. You know, <laughs> Chris, what was it like for you? I mean, you have some great scenes with Nero. I think I smell a new buddy comedy, just saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was scared like everybody else. You know, you, well, it was, I knew him before the movie, but, but you know, like I said, you know, I went there because I like the improv too, so I mess up my lines. I'm like, this, I'm looking at Robert De Niro, I'm messing up my lines. He was like, it's okay, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I messed up on Godfather, do it again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. De Niro. It was it was it was cool. It was it was really cool, and it, and that was the fun thing working with great actors. I mean, you feel like you you know you're right into the moment. You, and David got you right into the moment, and it was easy. It was like easy, a lot of fun. Where did you first meet De Niro? He came to one of my comedy shows at the Beacon Theater in New York with a friend of ours, Jer Jerry Anzarillo, another guy. And uh, he came there, and I was like, Mr. De Niro! We took pictures and all that stuff, and that's when we first met, in 2006 or something. Did you see him in the audience? Was he laughing? Cause I, I didn't, I sort of saw him, but I, you know, I yeah. was you know, in the audience. But I, I, when he came back, I was like, I knew he was going to be there. I knew he was going to be there, so I gave a little extra in the show. Because <laughs> you would have held back Oh, otherwise. yeah. I, I wanted to impress him. <laughs> And David, what about for you, working with De Niro? I mean, is that intimidating? Yes, it is intimidating. Um, you, know, um, you, you know, you treat him with an awful lot of respect. I knew that he was invested in the project because when we discussed the project and my personal experiences with my son, um, he was crying. And uh, that was at his house, you know, months before we did the movie. So I knew he was very much going to bring it. And he did. He memorized long, long monologues. And he set the tone for the set, which was extremely focused and respectful. And, uh, you know, every moment is so alive. You know, when Chris Tucker, it just, and you come up with great ideas for him to be embraced by, to embrace Chris Tucker and to tell him how to hold the remotes. And we met real people in Philadelphia who said their father pointed the remotes this way when the team is in this end zone and this way when the team's in this end zone. And, Bob, and Bob's, you know, Bob's char every character has to be very specific and Bob's was like that. And to, for him to show Chris how to hold the remotes and how to sit which he does in the movie. And then when, when they come to pick Chris up, and Randy has such a great laugh, Paulie has such a great laugh, which he does when he goes, you know, when he sees, look at those dancers, you could give me the money right now. Yeah. And then he goes, <clears throat> and then he also, and then he also and he starts laughing when they come to take, to take uh, Chris, Chris's character away. And I love that Chris is so in the moment, he's like, gives him such an angry, dirty look. He's like, right when Randy's laughing, he's like, he's like, 
He's like, why don't you check with the latest legal developments? He looks at, he looks over him. That was all very, very real. Um, so, and I, in Shay, when, 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 when Bradley Cooper talks to you, your eye twitches and you start to cry almost. You know, so that's how emotional, do you, I don't know if you see that every time. Your eye, right under your eye, it twitches every time right before you embrace Bradley. Robert De Niro is, a, is, is fantastic and he's real and he, and he says, make it real, keep it immediate and, uh, and don't think about it too much. And so he was extremely invested in everything from the handkerchief, only he would come up with the impro what he did about the handkerchief. He was supposed to explain the handkerchief to Bradley Cooper. And when Bradley goes, what is that? A handkerchief, and instead De Niro does this whole genius thing. He just kind of unfolds it. It takes a long time unfolding. He just holds it up to him. He goes, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, he just keeps doing that. And it's just this whole thing. Um, um, so, I mean, there's, and Jennifer Lawrence was the first Skyped audition I ever did. Um, that was, and that was to her parents' home in Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky, and then, we, then I was like a pro at it with everybody else after that. You know, a lot has been made about the fact that she Skyped her audition and won this role that I know a lot of people were after. Do you think there are advantages to actually doing an audition over Skype? Yes, absolutely. I think it's always good to, to show that you're willing to uh, step up by any means and to do whatever, which all these actors were willing to do, to step up by any means and to try anything any way. You know, we had 33 days to shoot the movie which is uh, 150 pages, you know, so that was a lot of work in a very short period of time. And you can only do that if everybody's very dedicated and willing to do whatever it takes to get through the day. Um, and I started to write for the rhythm of these actors. I wrote for the rhythm of Robert De Niro. I rewrote for him, you know, someone who would, because it was so personal to me, what I felt going through with my son, and that is my son who rings the doorbell and did, and did get a, <laughs> and did get a, that's him, yeah. He had to earn that. Thanks, yeah. We don't want him to be a Hollywood. Uh, he had to earn it the hard way. He had to do well at school. He had to do well, well with his behavior. And he had to audition. And, you know, he was so scared when Robert De Niro doesn't tell anybody what he's going to do. Robert De Niro didn't tell us he was going to cry. It was not scripted in the scene that he cries. It was not directed. I did not say, now you cry. Very often we'll do several takes and then I'll say, okay, we're done. And everybody relaxes and then I say, wait, let's do it again. And that is usually when something magical will happen that we don't expect. Because somehow something happens when everybody lets their guard down and they think they're done. And they forget whatever it is they had in their head, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and that's what we're always trying to capture. It's like performance capture. That's what our movie is, is trying to capture this authentic emotion. And that's what our film is about, is emotion. Um, that's really what it's about. And so he said one more, and there he was sitting on the bed with Bradley, and he started, I, was, what's, I didn't know what was happening. And then I realized he was crying. And Bradley and I were knocked, stunned. You know? And then he did it again for Bradley's coverage. Um, and so my son, you know, when De Niro came flying at him through the door, uh, and he pushed him, which he didn't tell anybody he was going to do. Uh, my son started laughing. You know, Matthew started laughing really <laughs> nervously. And uh, I said, you can't do that. You know, we couldn't get him to stop laughing. And finally, Mr. De Niro <laughs> played it. He played it. And he just played it very real. And he, and he said, that's like a young kid would laugh, you know, if a man in his pajamas <laughs> was coming out. <laughs> Because, he, because he'd be scared, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And, that was, and, I, and Bradley has said this before, and I'll say it again. Those amazing moments of reckoning with your relationship or your family always seem to happen at 3 a.m. in your pajamas. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what happened here. And I always had that vision of, that, of him chasing the kid and things really coming undone. Um, so. And I think I've heard, Shay, I believe I've heard you and Bradley talk about this scene where um, De Niro's yelling at you guys for having gone, get, gotten arrested, like, weren't you actually genuinely terrified? Yeah, yes. Um, it, we, I mean, as David Cuts, we, we had done another scene prior to us coming in and Jennifer coming into the parlay scene, we're going to bet, we're going to bet this, this is what the deal is. And so we had come back from being arrested, actually, originally. And um, the, uh, so we, <laughs> we walked into uh, Mr. De Niro, um, he was ready to go. It was completely quiet on the set. And we walked in from being, you know, Jake and Pat walked in from being arrested. And we looked over at him. And David just started to go. 
didn't even say and none of this action. He was just, and all of a sudden he came at us like a bull in a china shop. You know, he's you fuck, you fuck, you I and Bradley is is and I'm I had lines in that and I couldn't even I couldn't get anything out. I'm standing against the chest and uh, chest dresser and Dave's like, what do you think? I go, I, I wouldn't move right now. That's and I saw J Jake Lamont, I saw everything coming through and it was it was just palpably powerful of a moment as anything I've ever faced. And I've, you know, it was, it was electric in that room. And, yeah. you know, Bradley likes to say they had to do all this uh, cutting and because he was crying like a baby, dad, 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 all these high pitched sounds. <laughs> so they had to keep, they had to cut all that out because the was falling him around. You fuck you. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah, was, I was just standing there like, dad, dad, dad. Well, that's a, Jennifer always says that's the scene. That's the part that breaks her heart when he calls him a loser, when, when his father calls him a loser, yeah. which is really the first. He says, I'm not a loser, and that's, that always makes Jennifer cry, that yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, I want to take some questions from the audience. Um, well, actually, this first question is for Bradley. Chris, would you like to answer as Bradley? Yes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, you're playing a very different role from what a lot of people typically associate you with. Was that a conscience choice? And how did you go about preparing to play Pat, both emotionally and physically? And remember, you're the sexiest man alive. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> oh, wait, not anymore. Sorry. He's, he's, been, he's been dethroned. Brad, Brad, Bradley, Bradley uh, prepared by getting to know my son, my son's friends, the parents of my son's friends. Uh, and he had a very emotional, he's a very emotional, open person. You know, people may have heard me tell this before, but that was what I was struck by when I met Bradley, is that, you know, he was very frank about his own history and what he himself had gone through. And he was very open about his own emotions. And he was very... Uh, he wasn't necessarily guarded or prickly about them. And uh, he, he wanted to go there as an actor and uh, use the stuff. And that's all available to him. So he felt my situation, other family situations, and he became this guy. I watched him become the guy. I, and it was, you know, first thing we did was get rid of his hair and make him, sort of strip him down to this raw version of who he is inside. And you see the vulnerability in his eyes. And those are his scars on his face you know, that we just didn't cover with makeup. And we just, we accentuated a little bit. So he looks like someone who's been through the ringer as these people do. Um, and so he became this guy and he would play every scene a little more extreme. We played everything a little more extreme and then we ended up in the editing room choosing the lesser extreme ones. And sometimes you would keep the more extreme ones. But he really learned what it was like to feel like this person and to speak as frankly as that, to, to feel the shame of trying to, of trying to, deal with your life and trying to recover it and to feel the pride of being honest and truthful about what you want and, uh, and what you feel, even to your friend John Ortiz, who's supposed to be the successful one. You know, um, that, that was a beautiful thing that John Ortiz brought was that his character is struggling, you know, and, and, and that Bradley could actually talk to him. Is it true Bradley only had like two weeks to prepare for this movie? Yes, <clears throat> but he, you know, we'd been talking about my son for a while and I was feeding him information. You know, he had, I mean, I don't know, is that all it was? I don't, I don't remember the exact time frame. I don't see how it could just be two weeks. I don't remember. Is that true, John? It's what he says. What? Really? Mm -hmm. Why, because he was finishing another movie? Yeah, he was doing Place Beyond the Pines oh, he was, he was and he called him on the movie. set. Well, but, he, but what he remembers are these long phone calls. Yeah, <laughs> we would have these long phone, and we would leave messages. He would leave messages for me as Pat. He would do monologues that I would send him and he'd leave them on my phone as a message. And that's just, I'm a big believer in that. And uh, to take the, just, just go, go there. Write an email as that person, leave a message as that person. Um, I love the chemistry in the film between all the characters, not just Pat and Tiffany, but um, I love Danny and Pat's interaction. And Shay, you guys actually really feel like brothers. Uh, was that chemistry instantaneous? Had you met Bradley before or did it just sort of happen naturally? Well, we, we met uh, before briefly at the Beverly Hills Hotel, but I don't know if he remembers it, but we met. And uh, we met in the car. We had, uh, we, the first scene was in the car, and, and David, um, we was in the car talking about different stuff. Um, and then that's how we got, we bonded right there. Yeah, I, it's interesting because I, I didn't know him. I walked on the set, so I had to really, I mean, again, from an acting point of view, and, and I'll say, and, and Bradley put this piece on his back. He really did, David and Bradley, because it was 33 days, and that's, he's in every scene. And when you do that, 
It's, it's, a daunt, it's like climbing Everest. I mean, it's a daunting task. You have to take it one step at a time, and he put it on his back. And I think what he did, the, the thing that he did that was beautiful is he didn't play at Pat. He didn't go through and memorize a disorder and bipolarism. He just, he, he, he didn't play at it. He just was it. And that's a very, very fine line. I mean, you watch someone like Daniel Day-Lewis or Gary Oldman, these guys know how to do this, and they don't play at it, so therefore you're with them the whole time. And he, he knocked it out of the park, I think. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, but I mean, so I, I, didn't, I didn't have the chance, and I, I do like to work uh, from the inside out, not physical, and, and I, had, I was a bit nervous coming in, but he and I just really, um, it's all about or, or, organic. You don't force anything. You can't force being brothers, because then you're playing at it. So I just let it kind of come to us, and I think it just slowly started to, and he's a very giving, he's a very, you know, he's what a lot of great actors are, and this is what I was going to say about De Niro, he's, he's a very kind person who's capable of enormous volatility. And that's like Daniel Day, that's like Oldman, that's like De Niro. These guys are very kind human beings, and it shows on screen, but capable of, yeah. of volcanic, you know, eruption. And, and, and Bradley, I mean, we can't be more proud of him than Jennifer and De Niro. Uh, I have another question from the audience from Taji. Uh, wants to know, Chris Tucker, will you be pursuing future dramatic projects? Definitely. Definitely. Any <laughs> I think this guy, this guy's going to really, you know, you saw him in Jackie Brown, you know, and you saw him in this picture, and that was so, to see him, he can do, he has many weapons in his arsenal, and he, uh, he can soar high, uh, as people love to watch him fly, but he can also stay grounded as a real person, and that's, and that's very interesting, because what's going on inside of him, it's still there. All that, all that wildness and intensity is behind, and intelligence is behind his eyes. And that's what he brings every time he walks on in his Argyle sweater in the movie. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I, I love the Argyle sweater, and something I was going to mention earlier when, when Shay was talking, who had the brilliant idea to hang Shay's picture but not hang Bradley's? That was, that was a, uh, that was, you know, that, that was a, seemed like we should have his picture where he was a fallen. It yeah. was a nice thing. He, he, had, he was, he was, and it bothered him. It's the first thing he noticed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and where did you get his high school photo? You know, I don't know. This is all the production design department. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you have to say to them, well, get it. I want the real thing, and I want it to look like, you know, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's how you make sure they know. What, and you show them, I show them my yearbook so they know what I'm looking for. You know, that, that, not, not a candid, but like that. that, that. Well, wasn't Bradley's mom around on set, too? Yes, Bradley, De Niro and Bradley had a good chemistry because they had done Limitless, a film called Limitless together. So they had a very father-son relationship already, which is very helpful, just like Paulie and Robert De Niro are very comfortable with each other. And so when they go at it as a fight with the family, um, Paulie was really fighting and he becomes the bad guy of the movie, you know? And uh, it's a wonderful thing to have this, fr this friend who's a best friend who loves to take your money and... <laughs> And, 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 and torture you, you know. Um, we, all have, we all have had friends like that. And, uh, and so he was really able to stick up and say that's bullshit when Jennifer was saying, you know, he's twisting the knife right now, he gets off on it, and then, and then just prove it, prove it. That was all a scene that we improved as we kept doing the day, and it became really fantastic confrontation. Um, but um, there was a question I was trying Bradley's to Bradley's mom. Oh, Bradley. And Bradley and De Niro said, why don't we use my, we have a great idea. Let's put, make my mom, let's cast her as my mom. And that was a long pause moment. You know, I said, well, has she ever been in a movie? No. Okay, so I don't think we're going to do that. But I mean, I don't think she would have liked to have done it. And Jackie Weaver looks like his yes, mother, though. Yes, she does. You know, yeah. I mean, he gets his blue eyes from the Italian side of his family. And... Um, so it was very real. We had Italian food cooking in the house every day so people could smell it, and it just felt really like a real place. And I would, Vinnie Mazzarella, our, our uh, set decorator and prop master, and, which is fantastic, and I would say to him, is that Brajol, uh, is that ready right now? And he would say, yes, I would say, can I have one right now? He goes, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I would say, I just want one right now. And he would give me, <laughs> and says, and says, Everybody like would you. come in and look forward to eating the set. <laughs> Uh, I have a question from Napoleon. Um, wants to know, uh, were there any pranks on set? And does anyone have any rituals before arriving on set to prepare themselves for work? I try to exercise. I try to get up 
early and exercise and to be very clear and go over the day. I bring everybody into the van. The first, the, the, the keys, I want everybody together. It feels too scattered to me. So I bring everybody together in one van and I want everybody to go over the whole day in the van right then. And then the actors come in and we all sit in the van together. Because that's the movie. The movie's not scattered across the set with all this activity that's going on. The movie's in this van with these five people talking. And that's what everybody has to stay focused on. Because when you get out there on the set, it's really easy to get distracted and feel like, where's the energy? What's the focus? What's our direction? And nervous, you know? And you think it's about the camera. It's not about the camera. You know, it's about the emotion in that van. Any pranks on set? <laughs> you didn't have time. You had 33 days to shoot. No time, no time. Oh, there is one prank that I did. I mean, you know, I don't know, why, why do people like to hear prank stories? In Jennifer Lawrence's, uh, this comes back to Vinnie Mazzarella, the prop master. In, Vinnie, in Jennifer Lawrence's dance studio, there was a bathroom where she was changing, where Bradley saw her uh, disrobing and was entranced by her. Um, there was a toilet in there, um, but it was not a functioning toilet. And um, I... And we did it where we said, and Vinny made some expert, moist, real seeming, amazing, fake doo doo. <laughs> and, um, and we put it in there, and, I, and every, everybody said, Oh my God, David went to the bathroom in that bathroom. And, and, Jennifer, and Jennifer came in and said, Oh my God, David, how could you do that? I said, I said, I don't know, I don't know, let's just not think about it. And she, and she, and she said, and she said, and she, and she said, oh, I have to see this, I have to see this. And she, and she went in there, and you know, so that was then she went in there, and there it was, you know, and she went in there, and she just said, oh my God. You know, she and that was it. That was that was the one. That's the one that I remember. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Sophie, um, wants to know, Pauly, um, what do you think it would surprise people to know about Robert De Niro, having known him for so long? Well, you know, you, you just talked about ritual, and my, my ritual is that hopefully I get up, and then I go to work. <laughs> uh, but I know Bob, and for years, he, if he's got a six o'clock call, oh, if he has a six, <laughs> Bob travels with a trainer. And if the call is at 5 o'clock, he's up at 3, and he works out for two hours every day and really stress. They bring in a full room of equipment and everything, wherever he is, and, and he's so dedicated that, you know, he just gets up whatever time he has to work out for two hours uh, and then go to work. Me, like I said, I just hopefully wake up and go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Chris and Jay, do you guys have um, any pre-work rituals? Yeah, I went to Starbucks, I think that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up! Yeah. What are I'm you like uncaffeinated? Um, like this. <laughs> <laughs> Shay? Uh, no, it, it, it varies from, you know, I mean, boardwalk will be uh, different than, than something like this. It just depends on, you know, on, you know, on the character, you know what I mean? But, I tend to get very, well, the thing I loved about the night, I tend to get very quiet um, when working, just because everything comes back to me, personal relaxation and concentration when you're working. And, and I, you know, I enjoy, and, and it was, you know, this was a set that was very conducive to that. You know, but then I say that, but then uh, David would be, if the energy was low, um, he'd wheel in, he'd go, where's my microphone? And we'd need for the, for the dance or something, and, and they'd wheel in this microphone, and he'd say, "I need, I need white stripes," and the white stripes would come, Jack White would come blaring through, and everybody would be, you know, you, it would be exactly what you needed apropos to the scene, you yeah. know. So it was, it was, uh, we we were we would call ourselves kind of the traveling, you know, band of I forget what we were, David's, you know, disciples, whatever. We, we call did. ourselves Team Six. But that was because we, because we were like we could do anything. We were like because we 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 had to get the day done no matter what. We had to get the energy up no matter what. Yeah. Um, kind of a two-part question about auditioning. Um, first, for the actors, would you be willing to share with us your worst audition <laughs> experience? <laughs> Hanging for Mr. Cooper. I had so many bad ones. I don't. I can't even really single one out. <laughs> I remember I, I, I was auditioning for a TV show because I was just getting off the, you know, I was on the, the stand-up circuit, so I was trying to get 
to go to the next level. And it was either TV or movies, and I always wanted to do movies. But then I said, yeah, let's do it all and see which one I'm going to get. So I was auditioning for a TV show, and I was auditioning for Fridays. And it was a, a show about a biker delivering uh, stuff. And, um, and I remember I went to the last callback for the TV show, and I didn't get the TV show. They said they gave it to D.L. Hughley, another comedian. But when I walked out, my manager at the time told me I got Fridays. And I was like, yeah, I got a movie, you know, because I wanted to do that anyway. So, you know, just when one door closes, another one opens up. So always remember that. And if you had gotten the TV show, would you have been able to do Fridays? Probably not. Probably yeah. not. Yeah, so. Yeah, if I had gotten to make the movie five years ago, I wouldn't, this cast wouldn't have come together. I would not have rewritten the role for Robert De Niro. Many, many things would not have happened. I wouldn't have gotten to make The Fighter first, which deepened my ability and desire and focus to make movies about these kinds of people in these homes. So that all took place in that time. Che, did you want to answer the audition question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the second part of that question was, David, as a director, what do you look for in actors if they're auditioning for you? Mostly I want them to be, to be comfortable and game, you know, willing to try anything. And I always tell anybody who's going to audition, try it three, prepare it three different ways. And even if they don't want it, say it to them very casually, I can do this for you three different ways. I've got two other ways. You want to see it two other ways? But like in a, in a friendly, collaborative way, you know, like, um, like you're willing to play with it. I think that's the most important thing. Um, I want to mention, because I didn't at the top, that this film premiered at this year's Toronto Film Festival, where it won the Audience Award. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Chris, I know you and David were there. Were you there? No. No, OK. Um, what was it like to experience it in that theater? I, know it, I think it holds like 2,000 people. 2,600. 2,600, seeing it with like a paying audience for the first time. It's like seeing the picture at Dodger Stadium because it's so big and you can hear all the, the echo, the acoustics are very strange. It's a huge theater. And, uh, you know, I've been in that theater and haven't had a, had a movie not do well. You know, so it was wonderful to feel the room just exploding with emotion um, because we put so much emotion into the film. Um, and we can tell at the beginning of the film people, uh, they have certain expectations whenever they come into a movie. They, you know, they... Uh, they, they, they see Bradley Cooper and, and, the, and then they're immediately made uncomfortable because it's not the Bradley Cooper they expect and, it, and it's uncomfortable. The beginning of the film is uncomfortable. He's unpredictable, it's uncomfortable, it's emotionally uncomfortable, it's serious, it's dramatic. And then the movie has to, you can feel the movie win people back, you know, step by step, emotionally. Um, and that's just a very satisfying thing. And that was the first time also I ever walked out of a theater and had people walk up to me showing me tweets, which I don't even, you know, that it were happening as we were leaving the theater, which was it's just very strange to me. I, uh, I, I had never experienced that, but I don't you know. Chris? I mean, it was great. It was great. I mean, it was so many uh, moments, and then the laughter, because, you know, I'm a comedian, so I'm always looking like what the laughing and laughing, you know. <laughs> so they laughed at a lot of stuff that I didn't know they would laugh at when I was reading the script and when we was doing the movie. And then a lot of, every time I see the movie, because we watched it several times, I pick up something new from it. And that's what I'm like, man, that's when I know it's a yeah. good movie. And, uh, yeah. It's yeah. a very good movie. And thank you guys so much for being thank here tonight. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.